Good morning, everyone. Thank you for returning. Ladies and gentlemen, anaesthetists and anesthesiologists, analgesists and regionalists, resuscitationists and perfusionists, intensivists and reanimators, perioperative physicians and preoperative assessors, clinicians and academics, educationalists and simulationists, hospitalists and private practitioners, administrators and Sudoku masters. Welcome to the great airway debate in Perth 2017. We have gathered four notable, perhaps notorious, speakers to, to discuss three questions for you relating to front of neck access and then we invite questions from you on any airway related matter. You can use the app or you can use the microphone later on. Let's introduce the protagonists. Dr. Fiona Whelan, first on my right. Dr. Whelan graduated from the University of Western Australia and completed her internship at Fremantle Hospital. She completed her training in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery and be, was admitted to the College of Surgeons in 2008. Dr. Whelan completed 12-month fellowship in general ENT and head and neck surgery in Brisbane. She developed an interest in head and neck surgery per se and underwent a further 12-month fellowship in Canada. Dr. Whelan returned to Perth and joined the team at Western ENT where she welcomes all general paediatric and adult ENT and head and neck referrals. She also has an appointment at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital and is involved in the multidisciplinary head and neck clinic. Next on my right is Mr. Clinton van der Westhuizen, who graduated from the Durban University of Technology in Natal, South Africa in 1996, gaining registration with the Health Professions Council as an advanced emergency care practitioner. As well as providing pre-hospital care through high volume EMS systems in South Africa for both government and private organisations, Clinton is actively involved in education in areas of critical care and rescue for university-based courses. Clinton then took up a position with the Saudi government as a member of the emergency department team for the National Guard in Riyadh. He was a member of the cardiac arrest code team within the hospital and he was also responsible for early intervention in those patients arriving by private transport and ambulance and during critical care inter-facility flights. During his time in Saudi Arabia, Clinton was a faculty member of the Postgraduate Education Center at King Fahad Medical Center, where he provided instruction on ACLS and pre-hospital trauma life support courses. In 2003, Clinton returned to his passion of aviation, medicine, took up a position as flight services manager for international SOS in Asia. Initially based in Taipei, Taiwan, and then Beijing, China, Clinton was responsible for maintenance and delivery of international medical evacuations. In 2006, he joined St John Ambulance in Western Australia as an operational paramedic and then a clinical support paramedic. He's currently operating with RAC rescue helicopter out of Jandicott and Bunbury. Next, third on my right, Dr Andy Hurd is a staff specialist at Royal Perth Hospital, Western Australia. He established an airway training program and airway fellowship, which he's been running for over 10 years now. He's a foundation member of the West Australian Airway Group, a not-for-profit company aimed at giving better access for airway training to West Australian anaesthetists. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Western Australia and has published, as you probably know, a variety of papers on adult and paediatric airway management. Fourth on my right, Dr Andy Challen. Oh, forgive me for saying this, but you would think that 50% of airway experts are called Andy, <laughs> but I digress. So Andy is a resuscitationist and pre-hospital physician who has advanced training in both emergency medicine and anaesthesia with fellowships in airway and retrieval medicine. Don't you have enough to do, Andy? His passion is managing the critical casualty 
in austere environments. And he's a member of the military and has worked in over 10 countries in both military and non-military medical systems. Currently, he's working for New South Wales Ambulance. Well, let's get on to the business of this morning's session. I should tell you something that I can't quite forget. The editor of a local medical magazine here in Western Australia said, I remind him of a poor man's Tony Jones. Tony Jones is the host of ABC's Q&A program, which was on last night. Well, let me tell you that Tony couldn't be here this morning, so you're stuck with me. Uh, my name's Richard Riley, and I'm going to be your moderator and possibly the referee. So before we get on to the three scenarios which have been prepared, I'm going to ask each panellist to briefly describe their background that I haven't covered already. And they're pretty comprehensive backgrounds, I would say. But I'm going to ask them what their personal preference is for front of neck access and why. I'm going to sneak in another question. I'm going to ask them what medical equipment do they keep in their car or motorbike if that's what they drive. So each of them's got five minutes and when you get five minutes I'm going to operate my Star Wars Ewok Stridor simulator. <whistles> Just to give them a bit of time reference. So let me start by asking Dr. Fiona Whelan. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have anything to add about uh, my background. I think you covered everything pretty well there. Um, uh, when I first came back from fellowship, I also I'd spent some time at Fremantle. I had a few years there before I moved to Charlie's. Um, my emergency front of neck experience, I was thinking about that last night and um, trying to remember the specific um, episodes. And I think there's probably only been about half a dozen um, I remember the first one very clearly, as you probably always do. Um, and I think all bar one were as a registrar, which I think is important because uh, often it's the registrars who are actually in the hospital, um, whereas we might still be 20 minutes or half an hour away as a consultant. Um, they're all on adults. Um, they were all successful. Um, and uh, other than that, I've obviously had a lot of just general front of neck access experience with lots of um, urgent but not emergent um, airway access um, and just difficult tracheostomies in general. Um, so for me, I guess it probably goes without saying that my preferred um, method of access um, in an emergency is um, with a scalpel. And um, from the reading that I was doing, I think our teaching is really very similar in terms of the technique of using a scalpel to access the, um, the airway. Um, and perhaps the only difference is that we would just proceed to putting a tube straight in the airway, whichever tube that we can get handed, um, a microlary, a small ETT or a tracheostomy tube, um, rather than using a bougie. Um, and that's what we're most familiar with using. Um, and... I think, I guess, from a surgeon's point of view, it's about using tools that uh, we're familiar with. Um, the only experience I really have with using a needle to access the airway um, when we're doing very difficult elective tracheostomies, so usually in the um, patient who's had previous surgery, usually a previous tracheostomy, um, and usually radiotherapy, but I've got a very difficult um, woody fibrosed neck and we're concerned about um, the crods being medialised. Um, in those occasions, I've used a needle just to confirm that it is the airway that I'm about to cut into, um, but that's the only real experience I have with using uh, a needle or cannula access to the, to the anterior neck. So scalpel access for me. And what do you keep in your car? Oh, in my car. Um, I have, um, I actually, I currently have a mountain bike in my car and, um, <laughs> and I have, um, I have a really good first aid kit. It's um, a, a plumped up version of an RAC first aid kit. Um, I think there might be a mask in there. I've never really had to use it. I've got some gloves. Um, there is a disposable scalpel blade. Um, not probably for that purpose. I've got some <laughs> suture material. <laughs> you never know what you need when you're mountain biking. Good. Thank you very much. Can we move on to Clinton, please? Thank you. Morning, everyone. <coughs> um, just to add to the background, thanks for 
touching on all the good points. There's some bad points that I want to remember, but background-wise, uh, in terms of the training that we received um, in front of the neck access procedures, in my initial training in South Africa, we were fortunate to be exposed to cadaveric as well as plastic model training for both needle and surgical airways. And uh, due to the high volume EMS as well, as a student uh, undergoing training, there's quite a significant amount of exposure to, to difficult airways, which I, which I found quite fortunate. Um, as well as that training, being in Perth uh, and having a very good relationship with Royal Perth Hospital, we've been very fortunate, all the 14 critical care paramedics on the, on the helicopters at the moment, to have undertaken Andy's CACO uh, training program with the sheep models. Um, and, and here we've all found and seen absolutely how um, that temporizing oxygenation has a physiological effect, and it's actually um, it's quite amazing to see. I've also been fortunate enough to, uh, to complete uh, Richard Levitan's emergency airway course on the cadaveric models, and here I've also seen um, the pros of, uh, of the scalpel technique as well. Now, um, my experience with surgical techniques, I've performed two in Angon on, on, on two real patients, both were gunshot face patients. The initial one was a needle cracker, which I used in the days where we hadn't reviewed and initiated the use of the surgical airway with the gear itself, um, and I found limitations with that. And after reviewing that case and a few other cases, we then moved to surgical airway with a scalpel. Uh, in the 90s, we didn't have bougies uh, everywhere like they are now, so it was a, it was a straight scalpel finger um, and a size five. So on the helicopters at the moment, we currently provide uh, pre-hospital anesthesia to patients that are mostly unknown to us. We don't have their medical histories. We don't know their anesthetic histories. They've always got a full stomach with probably beer and chicken and some sort of other food. So we are presented with patients that have, that have, that have got messy airways. Um, and as such, my personal preference um, and part of what our algorithm is, we have the choice, but our personal uh, choice is the scalpel technique with or without a bougie. Um, the, 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 the presenting patients as well as the mode of transport and the environment itself also dictates that ultimately uh, in our role, we, we, we anaesthetizing these patients, we, we aim to end up with a cuff in their neck at some stage, in their, in their trachea. So whether we're going through the top or through the front, um, ending up with a tube is, uh, is the way we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna move. So the front of the neck with a scalpel is, is, the, is the obvious choice for myself. And it's for a number of reasons, not only that we, that's the end goal, but we want the airway isolated. We want to be able to maximize ventilation as well because we're going to be going to altitude. We want a nice isolated airway and we, and we want to be able to control everything by paralyzing them and having them absolutely ironed out. Um, the patients that are, that are not intubated and don't have a cuff, and when you are flying in a rotary winged asset, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to to, to see any passive regurgitation and any possible posterior airway soiling while you're flying, it's impossible. So that comfort blanket of a cuff and a tube is, is what we aim for. Um, and something that Fiona said, which I think is, um, is really good for us and what, the way we follow things is having familiarity with equipment is important and in particular in a high stressful situation. So for us, when we end up in that situation, I don't wanna have to start thinking about finicky difficult equipment that we don't use often, but we do use a bougie a lot. For our first choice grade one airways, we'll put a bougie in first with a tube going over it. We do use um, the tubes itself, obviously, plus mechanical ventilation, um, and we do get um, time with the scalpel uh, at the wet labs every year. So for us, familiarity in the high stressful environment and that equipment means that I feel comfortable using that equipment as my first choice. Um, the equipment's easy to set up, you can keep it anywhere, um, and it's, it's part of our packs, and it's part of a standard failed uh, airway. We don't really like to use failed airway anymore, but um, yeah, inevitable surgical airway algorithm. Um, and that's all, thank you. Thank you, and what do you keep in your car? Uh, size seven tube, a, four, a Mac 4 blade, a bougie and a scalpel, and a bag valve mask. That's all you need. <laughs> Defibrillator? Nah, it's too late then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Move on to Andy Hurd. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro, Richard. Uh, I mean, I just mm -hmm. add uh, my I trained in the UK initially as an intensivist and uh, and uh, an atheist, um, and then when I moved to Australia, I gave up the uh, the ICU side of things. 
My um, kind of introduction to CICO management uh, is probably also interesting as well. The, I had two CICOs um, as a senior registrar in the UK, uh, both within three months of each other. Um, the first one was a, a patient who had a bilateral radical, radical neck dissection, had a bleed into the neck uh, post-operatively on the ward, and uh, was pretty much peri-arrest by the time I, I got there. Um, I'd had zero hands-on training on how to manage the situation. All, all I'd done was prepare as per the exam, which was um, get a Venflon and put a Venflon in and cut a hole in the side of the oxygen tubing and, and deliver some oxygen, which is what I did uh, successfully. And then I thought, mm, this, that was the, that's where it ended. Uh, it was put the cannula in, deliver some oxygen, and then everything was meant to get miraculously better. And unfortunately, this patient was completely obstructed upper airway-wise, and uh, they needed a cuffed airway, as, uh, as Clinton's pointed out. Um, I mean, luckily at that point, I was trained in, uh, in doing per percutaneous tracheostomies, so I got a, a perk trachea from ICU and did a perk trachea on the patient. And uh, satisfyingly, I mean, don't get me wrong, I was lucky, and he was lucky that I was lucky, but satisfyingly, uh, the next day he was sitting on ICU with a size 8 trachea uh, reading the newspaper. Um, so that was my, my first CICO. The second one was a, a patient who, uh, who uh, was morbidly obese and actually turned out to have um, TB epiglottitis, uh, who was induced in front of me against my, uh, my will. Uh, again, I, 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 uh, we lost the airway. We couldn't oxygenate him from the top end. Um, I put a small bore cannula in, connected some oxygen up, and got his sats back up so he, from peri-arrest to uh, cardiovascularly stable. And then I thought, what do you do with children who have epiglottitis? You know, if you can't see where you're going, you squeeze the chest and look for bubbles. And um, so I got my colleague to jet while I looked down, and I could still see the picture of where the bubbles were coming from. And I passed a bougie and managed to intubate the patient um, from the top end. Uh, and those two, they, they kind of really highlight, you know, the, some of the reasons why we, you know, I recommend going for a cannula first. Um, you know, you can convert to a cuffed airway. So the statement saying that, you know, we can't do a cannula because we need a cuffed airway is false. Um, the, the milker exists, all you have to do is buy it, and then it's a Seldinger technique that you can convert. And the great thing about the, the way we're doing it is the Seldinger technique isn't being done under, uh, under a full pressure environment because you've already uh, secured an airway or you've, you've already located an airway and you've already uh, delivered oxygen to the patient. So the situation is now under control, so the difficult you know, threading the wire um, uh, is now something that people can manage uh, reasonably well. So, you know, as Clinton's highlighted, we've been running a wet lab, uh, for those of you who don't know, at Royal Perth now for probably 12 or 13 years, where we are every Tuesday, 48 weeks a year, we have two sheep. We do palpable anatomy uh, model and a, a fat neck model. Uh, and we do, we teach, and we've trialled uh, a variety of techniques. We teach uh, cannula first, um, uh, as our initial uh, um, uh, method of managing the CICO scenario. Uh, and if the cannula fails for whatever reason, then we would move on to a scalpel technique. Uh, so we, we've had probably over 1,000 airway specialists through, and we've watched probably 10 or 15,000 of these, um, uh, these uh, attempts being performed. And uh, I mean, I was looking this morning actually on the, on the survey monkey survey from the attendees uh, over over the last 18 months, um, and interestingly, 90% of the people who've been to the wet lab, where we teach both cannula and scalpel techniques, um, w uh, their first choice would be to go for a cannula. Um, so there's lots of reasons why. Part of it is, it's what, as, as anaesthetists, I mean, this is, you know, the algorithm that we teach off is uh, primarily an, an anaesthetist algorithm for in-hospital management where you have the equipment available that you require. Um, so it's most what most of us want to do, which facilitates us uh, transitioning to going around to the front of the neck rather than uh, continuing to persevere with upper airway attempts in a severely hypoxic patient. It's applicable in everybody, um, uh, so you, whether you can palpate the anatomy or not, it's a, it's a, it's a good first choice. Um, it's minimally uh, damaging, and, and that's one of the big problems with a scalpel blade. Uh, uh, I was speaking to one of my colleagues yesterday about this, and he was you know, saying about the shakes that people get when they do the wet lab. So the SATs are 70, you have to come in and uh, manage the, uh, the hypoxic dying sheet. Uh, yeah, people do get the shakes, but the shakes are far more, um, uh, have far more severe consequences if you're shaking with a scalpel blade than they do with a cannula. Um, so, you know, you can, you can go, it's something you can do in all situations. It's minimally, minim, minimally invasive. Um, and interestingly, from the reports that we are getting back from people who are, who are doing the techniques based on our uh, recommendations, 
Um, uh, it's about, about 50% of them, you know, as I've always said for many years, hence my obsession with apnea oxygenation, CICO events occur not because the patient is impossible to secure an airway from the top end, it's time pressure that's the problem. Uh, so you can't secure an airway in the time scale that you have to uh, intubate the patient before they uh, arrest from hypoxia. So the great, the great step with this, it's a minimally invasive procedure. You put a cannula in, you deliver uh, oxygen, and then you secure the airway from the top end, um, and all you have is uh, a small cannula hole in the front of the neck. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. And what do you keep in your car? Uh, look, the only thing I keep in my car is uh, a, a pediatric set. Um, one of my children had a uh, whooping cough when she was younger, and uh, she nearly obstructed on me, and I, it must have shocked me quite a bit, so that's what I carry. Uh, pediatric setup. I must have it selfishly dialed at the age of my kids. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Before I go into Andy Challen, um, normally at Q&A you'd find out the political persuasions of the audience. So perhaps I could take Andy's point and just ask the audience. If your <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, been proven around the world. Uh, it might not be what people are taught they have to do, but it's, uh, without question, the general preference for anaesthetists who are working inside a hospital environment. Okay. Thanks. Andy Challen. Good preference. <laughs> Hi. So, my background to this, like much of my medical career, was a bit um, topsy-turvy. I... Uh, had I um, came into being an advanced airway provider as a very junior doctor, so as a third year out doctor, without any real experience. I was a GP registrar uh, with the military and sent to Iraq. So uh, my, in Iraq, I uh, had to perform 10 front of neck access on uh, patients. Um, the initial technique I was trained with was the rapid four-step technique, which was basically a uh, horizontal incision with a surgical blade, cry hook, lifting, and then placing a tube uh, through that with the assistance of a bougie. Uh, my first four cases, I performed this technique and uh, actually struggled with it quite considerably, mostly due to the amount of trauma involved. So the first surgical airway I performed was on a tank commander who basically an RPG had hit a brick wall beside his face. Um, we were pre-hospital, the bricks had come and smashed his face. He had considerable um, facial trauma. I'd never intubated a patient at this stage. Uh, in my life, I'd intubated mannequins. <laughs> and, uh, and so, as you can imagine, struggled um, with this man's uh, top of airway, so they ended up uh, going for a surgical airway, which was completed successfully. The patient did survive. Um, but it was, it was a real struggle. The second patient was a sniper uh, who uh, shot an American soldier, again in the field, who was uh, providing uh, basically forward security and again had considerable facial trauma and upper airway bleeding and I went straight for a surgical airway on this patient, not even attempting intubation from the top and again struggled with the rapid four step. And so almost in and of my own um, kind of experience by my sort of fifth one, I converted to what I now know as the scalpel finger tube technique. And uh, I'd found that actually digital exploration with the, the finger allowed me to really have confidence with the anatomy I was dealing with and be able to find the airways in these patients rapidly and have confidence that I was placing the tube in the correct place. Um, when, I got, uh, when I got back from Iraq, I became involved with education and training of um, medical military doctors and medics. And, uh, and certainly we converted our practice to a scalpel um, scalpel finger uh, bougie tube. And this is the technique I used in two subsequent uh, front of neck access patients in Afghanistan when I was there as a, uh, as a resuscitation doctor. So um, subsequent to that, I've then received more advanced airway training. So I then became uh, an ED trainee uh, and then came, went on to anesthesia. And uh, I've completed Andy Hurd's course and uh, also Richard Levitan's course, I've done both his courses, both the emergency airway course and his advanced airway course. And I've also then, as an airway fellow, assisted in the Fiona Stanley um, 
pig lab that we um, run there, which I'd again recommend to anyone, uh, which is a different model to the sheep in that it's um, smaller airway in a larger neck, um, so it's a uh, ratio simulating a, a difficult uh, anatomy. Um, and I suppose then getting to the questions, what's my preference? It really depends what hat I'm wearing. I think that the most likely, the most likely time I'm going to come across a a Kaiko situation is in my pre-hospital work or emergency work. And in most of these patients, then uh, I need to secure the airway and I need to be able to ventilate the patient. Mostly it might be because they've got head injuries, it might be because they're particularly acidotic from um, sepsis, those sorts of things, uh, in which case I'm going to go for a surgical technique. As an anaesthetist, uh, wearing my anaesthetic hat in an elective situation, an unsoiled airway where the patient is not under physiological stress and hypoxia is going to be the killer in this patient, I think the temporising measure of a cannula is very appropriate. And for all the reasons that Andy just pointed out, there's less morbidity uh, and, uh, and harm you're going to cause to your patient. And then taking it to the extremes for things like uh, neonates or, uh, or paediatrics, trying to uh, do a surgical trachea in one of these a tiny airway, if you're not uh, skilled in this technique, I think it's almost going to be impossible. And certainly my preference in these patients is going to be, again, going for a needle first. And in fact, a needle cannula will allow you to ventilate these small children because you've got a big enough um, uh, airway secured with this. So, I, so, you know, without being trying to be too political about this, I think it really does depend on the patient in front of you, which is going to be the appropriate technique. As to answer the final question, what do I carry in my car? IGL LMAs, uh, a pocket bougie and a scalpel and size six Parker tip tube. Uh, and that's uh, my emergency airway equipment that I keep for myself. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to ask the speakers when they talk to bring the microphone a bit closer. Um, some of our audience can't hear some of your replies, please. Someone in the audience has already uh, interacted and said they wonder if we should still be having this debate. What we can take away from what we've just heard is it's a little bit dependent on the kind of training you have, the kind of equipment you have at hand, um, and the situation in pre-hospital, in hospital, in helicopter, whatever situation you're faced with. So it is a little bit dependent. And I guess the, the college has taken the view that um, Australia, New Zealand, and, um, and Hong Kong trainees will learn both techniques. Well, let's move on. Um, I think with the introductions out of the way and you know where your panellists stand, if you're ready, ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. First question. That's just to get us all in the mood. This is what happens, people, when you don't floss. <laughs> this is case number one, and I'm going to ask each of the panellists, after they've read the two slides, what they might do. They won't have a lot of time, but you can read that it's a 46-year-old man having arthroscopy in a hospital. Things don't go according to plan. So you are unable to ventilate after you've attempted to place an eye gel in the classic LMA. You've given more propofol. You can't bag mask ventilate. You've given 100 milligrams of rocuronium. You still can't ventilate. Laryngoscopy, grade four view. Unfortunately, you don't have any video laryngoscopes available. The saturations are dropping. Fiona, you're there, what would you do? It's your, you happen to be walking in to talk to the anaesthetist and you see all this happen. What would you do? Um, I, think, I think our Can role... Can I get you, sorry, to sorry. bring the um, Our role often is... Yeah, we often stand back and we can sort of see what's going on and, and we often wait for the guidance and the cues from the anaesthetist. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with all the anaesthetic techniques, but on looking at that story and seeing that things weren't going so well, I would probably already be speaking to the theatre nurses to ask them to get um, a scalpel ready for me and open a tray. Um, uh -huh. And I would be ready to 
you know, to proceed with the surgical airway to do an emergency cricothyroidotomy. Um, so you're yeah. helping make preparation. Mm -hmm. Clinton, you're, you're uh, observing the situation, you're doing a hospital observation. This yeah, happens. that's probably the only time I'm going to be exposed with this in the tertiary facility. So, um, you know, in a tertiary facility where there are people that are exposed to scalpels on a more regular basis, I'd probably say that in this situation, I'd also be comfortable with a temporising needle just to get the oxygen up, just to keep that, uh, keep the saturation within a safe range while, you know, the, sh the man at the end of the uh, at the corridor is probably going to come and do a, a definitive tracheostomy. So I'd probably say a needle to temporise, uh, and, and, uh, and I wouldn't be transporting him or flying him, and particularly in this case where it's an elective surgery, you know, where the, there's a chance that they may want to wake him up. So if they don't want to move on to the tracheostomy, they could probably temporise the oxygenation and then maybe wake him up, um, if that's enough to keep him to where he needs to be before he's woken up. Andy, what's your opinion on the sequence that you saw here? Is it reasonable? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things with with transition to CICO or going around the front of the neck is, uh, you know, it can happen in any direction from any any uh, any area. Um, I am very interested in transition and, and, and declaring a CICO. So I would say in this situation, I hoped uh, once the bag and mask had failed and Larangoski was failing, that people had asked called for help. Um, uh, asked for the difficult airway trolley to be brought in, and I think this pretty much meets my criteria for declaring a CICO. Um, uh, I would uh, get somebody to apply rescue oxygenation at the top end um, while I move around to the front of the neck, depend on whether his anatomy was palpable and there was an ultrasound machine there. I might have a look with the ultrasound machine, uh, but then I would go with a, a, a cannula first in, in if I can palpate the anatomy and through the cricothyroid membrane, if I can feel it, or the trachea, or if I can't feel anything, I would go um, in my best guess at midline. Andy, can I ask you one question? Is there still a debate about whether that 100 milligrams of rocuronium should have been given or not? Are we, have we moved on from that? Is that still controversial? Uh, look, it's, you know, I mean, if you go through NAT4 and, and the 200 and 83 recommendations from it. The, certainly in there, it's pretty strong that the patient needs to be paralysed um, before they die from hypoxia. Uh, um, and I mean, that certainly would be my approach. I, I, I'd be more than happy with a large dose of rocuronium in this situation. Andy Chellan, would you do anything differently? Um, so, so I think everything that Andy just said um, is really important in that it's, it's actually about the team dynamics in this situation, getting everyone onto the same shared mental model of where this patient's at and having the room, understanding what's needing to go on and optimising your team dynamics. And then making that mental transition, as Andy said, to this is now a Kaiko situation and making sure that you've optimised all of those supraglottic attempts. So the patient is paralysed, you've tried different devices which have already been attempted, you've had the best operator have an attempt from the top. So doing all those things first I think is absolutely critical. In terms of what device is appropriate, it really depends on where you are. And this is a really interesting thing because we're talking about needle versus scalpel. If this is at Royal Perth or at Fiona Stanley, absolutely needle's going to be appropriate because I think the trolleys are set up for that and all the right devices and equipment are there and, uh, and I'd be very confident in the equipment there. If this was at a private hospital where they didn't necessarily have the cannula kit set up the way that we have at our tertiary hospitals, then um, I know I've got my scalpel in my pocket and I carry that all the time and I know that by dilating up... No, it's... And, I mean, people... people I'll, I'll cover the, I mean, a lot of people question me when I walk in a room with a scalpel in my pocket, and um, particularly through airports. No, just kidding. Um, it's, uh, it's, no, the reason is, it's actually for, for two reasons. Um, one, I have the equipment I need to access the neck. So often it's not in theatre that I'm going to be doing these Kaiko situations. If I go down to ED, studies will tell us that it'll take up to 18 minutes for people to find a scalpel in order for you to affect this. And I've certainly uh, experienced this. In fact, recently uh, at a hospital where I was working, we sent our ENT surgeon down to manage, uh, to provide uh, front of neck access to a difficult patient. 
and um, and no one knew where the uh, where the scalpel equipment was. Now it was actually two metres from the patient in a drawer, but no one in that resuscitation bay knew where it was. So I carry the equipment I need. The second reason I have it in my pocket, it's a commitment. I've already made that mental transition that if I need to provide Kaiko. Um, uh, front of neck access to any of my patients, I've already mentally promised myself I'm going to do that. I'm not going to hesitate. I'm going to provide the care for my patient that they require as an advanced airway provider. And so it's also part of my mental preparation when I take on the role as an advanced airway provider that I am prepared both mentally and physically to do that role. And so I go back to if the equipment is appropriate, if I've got a Leroy and all the appropriate equipment, I'd be very happy putting a cannula in this patient. If that equipment was wasn't there, it was, there was unfamiliar cannula, I would go with what's familiar and stuff I know I'm gonna, that's going to work, and I would go for, um, for a scalpel uh, tube. So it's going to depend on what the setup is there and what equipment is available. Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> two, two scal I guess if you've got a gun, you've got to be prepared to use it. <laughs> two scalpel stories. I was stopped at Brisbane Airport uh, through X-ray, and they found a small scalpel in my carry-on luggage, it's the one you find in Arrow Central Line <coughs> kits, it's, so it's quite small and I thought innocuous and the gentleman asked me what that's for and I said that's to cut people's necks and uh, so, <laughs> so, so he took it off me. <laughs> and more recently uh, uh, a colleague of mine who, who's well known to many of you with uh, this society um, assisted a colleague at a private hospital here with a Kaiko situation and asked for a very small scalpel and that's exactly what the nurse gave him, a very small scalpel blade. No handle, just the blade. So language. Um, I, I know what you're thinking, well what, what would MacGyver do? Is, is, is Dr MacGyver in the audience? The I'm sorry, he's gone to the airport. So in that case we're going to move on to case two. We have another situation. We're all in the situation room this morning. 66 year old female transferred from ED to you for an emergency laparotomy. She, she has a suspected perforated duodenal ulcer with shock. And the rest is pretty bad news. I'll let you read that. So you've determined that this is not futile surgery, this lady's best chance is to have an operation. This is your induction. So it's a dynamic situation. I think it's really unfortunate that some patients continue to deteriorate while you're getting things ready for, to um, put your plan into action. So I'll ask, starting with Andy Challen at the other end. Yeah, so I think this is, this is a great case um, and very typical of the sort of situation where we are likely to see a Kaiko situation. Um, it's going to be in an unfamiliar environment with a difficult patient and I think the real key to this patient here is their physiological state. And again, it's going to come back to it depends. Now one bit of information we don't have here is a blood gas. If this patient's already in a severe metabolic acidosis, um, the loss of ven ventilatory drive here could possibly kill them from acidosis. So we talk about the three big killers of airway, hypoxia, acidosis and hypotension. And all three of these are potentially going to kill this woman. This woman also has, um, if you look at her um, ongoing clinical course, she's going to need a secured airway at some point. Um, and this is not a woman who's going to rescue her own airway if we allow her to wake up. And we don't really have the time for more advanced people to come in um, and necessarily provide more advanced techniques. So certainly in this case, this is for me a very clear cut of going straight for a cuffed tube in the airway. And the quickest way I can affect that is uh, with a scalpel finger bougie tube. I know I can be inside that woman's airway in 40 seconds and have a secured tube um, from experience. So that would be certainly my, my approach in this woman. Andy Hurd. 
Anything different? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, these sort of cases where um, what you, I, I would say this is kind of split between a rapid sequence where you're, people, you're worried about, uh, you know, obviously um, aspiration risk, uh, and on the flip side, what I would call rapid intubation. So somebody who uh, is likely to desaturate quickly, and um, uh, and then maybe arrest from hypoxia. So. I mean, looking through that case, I might try a different, another laryngeal mask, um, a different type maybe, before I, I declared a, a CICO. But with a SATS of 77 and dropping, I think we're pretty close to being a, a CICO scenario. Um, it's interesting that it's a rheumatoid arthritis patient. I, I used to do a lot of, a lot of these for, uh, on orthopedic uh, lists, and you know, their front of neck anatomy can be pretty difficult to palpate. Um, uh, I found that actually the, uh, the cracothyroid membrane uh, can be concrete. Um, you can virtually not put anything through it. Uh, um, so this is actually, there's a good chance this is going to be a difficult uh, a neck anatomy patient um, with limited uh, access. I would still, you know, uh, you know, it's why we call it CICO. I mean, I'm worried about the hypoxia primarily. Um, I would go for a cannula first. Um, I would, uh, if I'm successful, I would uh, deliver a four-second jet, a two-second jet, and then immediately convert to a, to a cuffed airway using a Melka. So, I mean, based on our current jetting plan, uh, you know, from delivering oxygen to converting to the Melka, uh, you know, or starting to convert to the Melka, should I say? I mean, there's no guarantees anything successful. Um, you know, is 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 in, in the area of about 30 seconds. So. Yeah, I'd go for a cannula first, um, uh, manage the hypoxia, and then convert to a cough airway at the earliest opportunity. Okay, if you're once again an observer, um, Clinton, and the anaesthetist is so overcome with grief and emotion that he becomes unable to do anything more after his failed needle technique, what would you do? Oh, you know, just I, I look at this case and I think of it as a, as a is a case that I would see outside and the fact that it's not elective. None of our patients are elective. We've got the, the luxury of her medical history, but you know, we've almost got to look at this case as, well, she's just been put in front of you. Um, she's not going to be woken up. She needs, uh, she needs some intensive care. So she's going, to be, she's going to be ventilated for some time you know, while they sort out all the other bits and pieces. So um, again, horses for courses and situations. And, it's important to realize that for, for us, and I'll, and I'll talk about the pre-hospital setting because my decision making will all be based on what we do outside, but for us in the pre-hospital setting, having decisions, uh, sorry, having options and having, having abilities to have different options is often, it's often great. It's a luxury, but sometimes having too many options can also muddy the waters. So we always talk about having the two options, the needle or the surgical. Um, and in the case where the patient is not going to be elective, not going to be woken up, is going to need ventilation and is going to need a cuff, um, I'm more than likely to go towards a scalpel, bougie, and put a tube in as well. Um, something that might change my decision would, would be in my assessment and looking at the patient himself and going, you know, if she's got a horrible looking neck from the front where I think I'm going to have to be doing a, a fair bit more exploration, uh, or if it's a neat, nice cricothyroid membrane that I can see without even touching the patient, that might, make, you know, might, might change my decision. But essentially, if they're going to be sick and getting sicker, uh, and they're gonna, we're not going to be waking them up, and they need uh, ongoing care, I'd be saying probably a scalpel bougie and a, and a size six going through that. Fiona, you've heard the bell, because they've declared an emergency, and you've gone into the theatre next door. You're told that the patient is rheumatoid on steroids, and things are going very badly. And they, and they see and they recognise you as an ENT surgeon. What's your approach? Um, and again, by the time we get called in sometimes to these cases, um, it's almost easier when the patient has, has got into this situation when the, you know, if the SATS is, SATS is 77 and the patient's clearly obtunded. Um, for me, there's, there's no hesitation um, to proceed with the surgical airway and, again, a scalpel and finger and a tube. Um, I think you can feel the anatomy very easily in most patients, perhaps excluding the ones who've had previous uh, surgery and radiotherapy um, once you've made your incision through the skin. Um, and I think the membrane's pretty, pretty easy to feel. Um, so, yeah, so I'd be, I'd be heading straight to that. But which part of the trach trachea would you be looking at? 
Um, so cricothyroidomy in an emergency situation, um, and you know, this patient's likely to, you know, quite possibly would be getting called to do a tracheostomy from ICU eventually anyway for a patient like this. Um, and the decision then is do we convert at the time, um, and that would just depend on the stability of the patient, um, or go back a few days later and, and uh, change it to a formal tracheostomy. Well, I've seen a plastic surgeon take 45 minutes to do a tracheostomy during cardiac arrest. Would it be rude of me to ask you how long it would take you to do an emergency tracheostomy in this situation? To do an emergency cricothyroidomy, maybe from the time I walked in, I would hope it would be about 30 seconds if, if someone gave me a knife and a tube. Mm -hmm. um, it should be pretty quick. Um, and if you're doing you know, a formal tracheostomy, you can take as long as you like if the airway is already secure. Um, but that's, yeah, 45 minutes. It's not an emergency situation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can, I, can I just make a comment? Yeah, sure. There's, there's sure. Two, two things I say that. To what, I mean, we, we did a survey of CICO or CICV events that Anethis around Australia had. Um, uh, we did it we did this about five years ago, and, and I think I, if I can never remember the numbers exactly, 30% of the CICVs the patients had impalpable uh, airway anatomy at all. So that's one in three, you couldn't feel the trachea or the cricothyroid membrane. Another 20%, you know, they could find the trachea probably, but nothing else. So. I would say most of the patients that we, uh, as an atheist, are going to have this problem. Uh, it's, it's probably, well, let's say 50-50 that they're going to have easy anatomy or not. And it's interesting that this case, um, we had a case like this at Royal Perth about seven years ago. I wasn't involved in it. Um, and uh, the, it took the ENT surgeon, uh, I think, 25 minutes to secure an airway. Um, and the SATs were at 20 for, for, the, for the whole period of time. So. Uh, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, how long is a piece of string? You know, if it's a difficult one, it's, it's difficult, uh, you know. And, and I think that's, um, that's a good point in that the ENT surgeon or the surgeon may not be the most experienced or appropriate person in theatre to be dealing with, with the situation. And if you've got um, an ENT surgeon who hasn't done a lot of head and neck, for example, um, or who hasn't had exposure to um, difficult airways for a long time. The registrars are certainly the, the ENT surgeons who do the most of the airways, um, the emergency airways, because they're there. Um, but yeah, it might be that the anaesthetist is definitely the most experienced person to be dealing with it, and that's the dynamics of the team and understanding it should be the best person for the job at that time, not necessarily the surgeon. Just they may not be the best person. I wasn't implying that they were. I think it was just a really difficult case. I wasn't saying they were. I mean, yeah, I don't think the yeah. would have uh, necessarily yeah, been any yeah, quicker. But they um, may have. A, a question and a comment come through the app that I'm just going to pass over to the panel. One said, um, should we be doing more diagnostic fiber optic laryngos laryngoscopy and avoiding the problem? Um, have video laryngoscopes made us complacent? I mean, I know it's a good day when a trainee is able to do conventional intubation without a bougie. I think that's a great day. It's a great day. <laughs> but maybe it's just the volume of cases and the reliance on LMAs. So I'm, I'm going to ask the panel again. Should have video laryngoscopes made us complacent? I'll start. Uh, look, I mean, this is an interesting debate because, uh, I mean, this came up actually in an editorial in ED in one of the big um, journals there a couple of years ago, and um, a comment was made by a very senior airway, ED airway editor in one of the journals um, that video laryngo that direct laryngoscopy was dead, you know, that videos killed the direct laryngoscopy star, I suppose. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that um, the rescue for video laryngoscopy is direct laryngoscopy. And, uh, and so, absolutely, um, with all these things, and I think this goes to the essence of what this whole debate is about, is that good airway planning uh, for every single case, because 50% of KAIKO events are going to be unpredictable from the anatomy and the patient presented from you. They're a rare event and it's going to be unpredictable. You need to have a very clear plan in your head of how you're going to progress through the various stages of airway management for every single patient you step up to. And appropriately, you probably should have communicated that plan to the team 
being your anaesthetic technician and the nurse assisting you. Now, interestingly, I find most anaesthetists don't do this. I do this with most of my techs. In fact, I do this with all my techs, and I often get a surprise, look, are you worried about this airway? Because you've told me your plan A to D, like, what's wrong with this patient? I said, no. They're actually, they're melon patty one, they're a normal neck, but I want you to know that if this airway goes this way, this is what we're going to do, this is the technique we're going to use, this is what I'm going to reach for. And that way, it's an anticipated event rather than an emergent disaster where we haven't discussed our full plan. And that's what I do with every single airway I approach, whether it's emergency, medicine, anaesthesia, pre-hospital. Um, and as part of that checklist, I want to know where all the equipment is for that. So I think, um, you know, with all these new techniques we have, fibre optics, video, direct, you still need to have a plan B, C, D for all of your patients. Have all the equipment checked and ready and know where it is so that you can then transition through those plans rapidly in every single case. I'll, I'll add to that as well, Andy. Um, the checklist is a huge thing for us and the checklist almost... Um, you know, gets your commitment from the beginning. And we've got a, a pre-induction checklist and then a post-intubation checklist, but also to the side of it, we've got a simple, um, you know, we, we are unable to secure the airway checklist. And then we have a pre-brief before we do that, every time we do that. With regards to the video laryngoscopes, um, I started getting a bit nervous when I started seeing new trainees pull out the video laryngoscope first and say, well, I, you know, I can't see. In pre-hospital emergency care from airway perspective, the basic airway intervention from bag valve mask ventilation is probably the most important thing that we teach, but I think it's overlooked a lot of the time because often that's, the, that's what's going to get you out of the poo-poo in the end. If you can bag that patient with a nasopharyngeal airway or an oropharyngeal airway, and obviously you know, we've, we've advanced to apneic, hypox, uh, apneic oxygenation as well with high-flow cannulas, but in terms of the video, I think that we, we have to be mindful, and we are certainly, when we train our new people, that first of all, if we're going to use a video laryngoscope, that it needs to be the same as your direct scope. So it needs to be a Mac blade, at least. Because if you are pulling out a, uh, a different blade that's going to give a different view, you're going to get stuck. So having a Mac blade and a Mac video laryngoscope is a must if Mac is your way to go. Having a third option, yeah, maybe. But as I said, th more than two options starts to get the, the waters muddy. Video laryngoscopes are great, um, and to be honest, every time I've actually put one in during training, I've immediately looked at the vocal cords and been tapped on the shoulder and said, have a look at the screen. But I'm old school, and I think old school is good school. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll just, sorry, just one quick further comment. Um, in the current service where I'm working, New South Wales Ambulance, we've got the portable uh, C-Max, and actually the paramedic intubates in our service unless there's anatomical or physiological reasons not to. So if it's uh, uh, pre-hospitally and even into hospital when we go. Um, and what the way we do it is the, have the actual screen turned off to the assistant. And it's amazing how powerful the tool that is because then the airway uh, instrumenter is using a direct view and instrumenting the airway and the assistant can then see exactly what they're seeing and knows what's going on inside the airway. So video can be a really powerful way of having a visual shared mod model of what's going on inside an airway and that's the real power of uh, video laryngoscopy. I think Andy was talking about what some people call sharing mental models when you're all on the, on the same page. And it used to be some years ago when you're very worried about a patient's cardiac status, you would bring a defibrillator into the room and that would get a lot of nurses' attention. And equally, I guess, prepping the neck in advance of a potential failed airway might get some other people's attention. Uh, one, of the, one of you's kindly offered or recommended marking the neck in cases of... Um, predicted difficult airway. And another person's asked, can I ask Fiona whether there is a place for rigid bronchoscopy in the first scenario? Uh, the Would you patient? use a rigid bronchoscopy? Oh, the orthopedic patient. Yes, the orthopedic. orthopedic patient. Um, to be honest, um, I guess if you happen to have the equipment there, which would be unlikely, um, rigid bronch set in adult theatres I think it would take them 10 minutes to find it. Um, so, so, yeah, I guess in, in theory you could, but I think the time constraints to finding that equipment um, practically in theatre, you'd be, you'd be better off with a surgical airway. Um, 
Can we move on to the third case then? And there's still time for some more questions. Oh, Richard, I think there's a question up at the microphone. Oh, sorry. Yes. I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I don't have a smartphone, which probably isn't very smart. But um, this is a difficult intubation, and, we, and a potentially difficult intubation, a very sick patient. Would any of you do a preemptive strike, get the milker in awake before going off to sleep? Panel? Um, Responding from our side of things, obviously, if, we, if we're going to be going in a, in a helicopter, the patient's not going to be asleep awake. He's going to be asleep in the end anyway. So particularly the patients that, if we, if we preempted a difficult airway, um, it's probably because he's hypoxic, head injured, polytraumatized or something. So from our perspective, um, we want the patient as flat as they can be um, so we can absolutely isolate the airway and take control of that. And, that, and that's, you know, that's, that's my arena. That's where I'll be doing it. <laughs> I mean, I think a, a preemptive something is definitely a, a, a good idea if you have the cooperation of the patient and the time and the equipment to do it. Um, I've done quite a few preemptive cannula insertions uh, prior to in, in, inducing patients, specifically head, and, head or face trauma, um, where the, uh, the nose is blocked with blood, they've got a little four, three facial fracture and they can't open their mouth. Uh, they're pretty hard, to, pretty hard to manage. You've no idea what you're going to um, proceed to. So certainly if the anatomy is palpable in the front of the neck, uh, then I, I would put a, an 8 or 14 gauge insight cannula in and tape it down. Um, it's, a real, it's a real bonus, actually, um, because the thing is you know you've actually got an, an, an avenue for delivering oxygen to the patient. You've got an avenue where you can convert it to a Melka. I mean, I haven't done that in an awake patient, but um, uh, uh, certainly, if you induce a patient and you can't um, intubate them or oxygenate them from the top end, you can oxygenate and then convert to the malchus through the front of the neck. So it's slightly more difficult in uh, the patient with impalpable anterior neck anatomy, uh, um, obviously. Um, with an ultrasound, you can still attempt to put a cannula in. Um, I, in that situation, I would, I would probably pass a wire down the cannula and, and, cl and clamp the wire so that we didn't lose it. Um, otherwise, the cannula tip isn't in far enough in the airway for it to be guaranteed to, uh, to stay there when you're trying to do your, your induction process. Andy, can I just ask you then, so the patients in whom you're considering or assessed to be difficult, potentially difficult with the airway, are those the same patients are more likely to have difficult airway anatomy to palpate? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes not. Um, it depends, you know, obviously depends on, on the patient. I mean, the, the facial fractures, um, you know, down in ED, uh, I mean, the three that I've come across, or, well, two I've come across, one I was told about over the phone at 11 o'clock at night, um, you know, they actually had very normal anterior neck anatomy. It was the face that was smashed, not the neck. Uh, um, but, yes, I mean, obviously there's a chance that the difficult always is going to have a difficult neck. Case three, this is the last of the prescribed cases. So this is a 54-year-old male in a small regional hospital, five-day history of sore throat and fever. Agitation with strider. <laughs> Panel, what would you do? I'm, I'm going to fetch this this person, and we're going to be flying this male to a, you know to a tertiary hospital. So it's going to be a cuff tube for me, um, and that's probably going to be delivered with a with a scalpel and a bougie, um, and, and and like Fiona said as well, being comfortable doing it fairly quickly, I'd be happy to get it in, get it sorted, and then start affecting the transfer. We'll be flying at altitude, um, and we'll we'll need a good cuff so we can maximise oxygenation. So it'll, it'll be a scalpel bougie for me. Andy's? Yeah, I mean, this is a very, again, very familiar situation with both my work with RFDS and New South Wales Ambulance, and I work in EDs in peripheral places like um, Port and Esperance. Um, I mean, interestingly, you know, when you're controlling a situation, you need to control yourself, your team, the environment, and the patient. And this is a case where the patient might become, be coming out of control and might be contributing to the, the whole um, situation quickly uh, escalating and, and going out of control. And this is where the ED concept of delayed sequence intubation might be really, really beneficial. And the concept of that is providing um, some sort of hypnotic agent, usually ketamine, in order to um, 
to calm the patient down and then allow adequate oxygenation. And that may then uh, allow for a more controlled um, approach to this airway. So a bit of ketamine, you get some CPAP on this patient or BiPAP, you use your ventilator to achieve that. And that may calm this whole situation down. The stridor may even resolve with some positive airway pressure. Um, and then that might buy you time to then, um, you know, bring in additional resources, that sort of stuff, or to rediscuss the plan. Um, and this may even be a case where, uh, depending on the anatomy, um, if you've already had a look at the uh, larynx and this is an epiglottitis or um, something like that, where you're looking at this epiglottis and it looks more like, um, uh, you know, um, like a cervix, um, which, we, you know, then you're sort of just going to be going, well, you know, maybe this is the patient that we do the, uh, the awake um, surgical airway. And if you can bring uh, an ENT surgeon in for, to help with this, that is absolutely my first preference. Um, if not, then again, um, as someone who has to provide advanced airway in these remote places, then you've got to step up to the plate and uh, know your anatomy and know what you're doing. So I'll, I'll just finish off on that. I agree entirely. Um, that you know, this patient's about to, has an obstructive, but is, is about to, and I think this would be the patient to not proceed with a fibre optic. Um, and, you know, if you had the luxury of having um, your ENT surgeon there, this is definitely a case for an awake tracheostomy. Um, and a lot of it probably is trying to, if you can calm the patient, um, I'd do a proper tracheostomy, and, and if it was really um, becoming unmanageable, then... Um, an awake emergency cricothyroidotomy. And just some quick answers from the panel. Would you be using any other adjunct, adjuncts while you're getting this patient ready? Would you be using mm. adrenaline nebs? Would you be using Thrive? Would you be using helium? Anything else if you had enough staff to do that? High flow nasal oxygen. High flow nasal oxygen? High flow nasal oxygen. Mm -hmm. okay. And as long as nothing was going to delay actually the definitive management of the airway. So if it's going to be taking time to get everything else organised. Yep. Um. I, mean, I, well, I agree with what Andy said. I mean, uh, you know, you need to try and get this patient under control. I mean, I, I've seen quite a few wave fiber optics where the patient isn't getting oxygen while everybody's getting ready. So um, it may be just be some simple uh, um, uh, a, a, B, C sort of manoeuvres. Um, I kind of, I don't like the, the did you say, I think you said delayed sequence uh, uh, induction, um, is, that, is that what you called it? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what this is, because what you're trying to do here is you're trying to get a patient to tolerate the situation that they're in. Um, you're, you're not immediately progressing to an intubation following, uh, following uh, um, that. So for me, this is you're trying to calm the patient down and get them more stable to see if you can progress with doing your awake, your, your awake fiber optic. The, the, the other thing is that in patients like this, okay, I mean, the tracheal tug that they have when they're awake and trying to breathe is, some, is unbelievable, right? So trying to stick a scalpel blade, certainly as a non experienced ENT surgeon, into this neck is really difficult. Um, I mean, putting a cannula in is equally difficult, but at least you're not going to cause this much damage. So, um, uh, you know, I would be very reluctant to try and do a, a scalpel bougie technique on, on, on this patient um, whilst they were still moving. Thank you. I have a question for Fiona from the floor. Some very interesting questions are coming through. We only have about 20 minutes to get them, so I'm going to try and keep the panellists short. Uh, Fiona, is there a consensus among surgeons and surgical trainers regarding emergency surgical cricothyroidotomy versus emergency tracheostomy? Uh, the writer feels that there is, in the UK, a push for ENT to do cricothyroidotomy, but less so in Australia. What's, what's your feeling? Um, our, our teaching is certainly for an emergency cricothyroidotomy in a, in a real emergency situation. Um, this situation might be slightly different and perhaps perhaps you have a little more time, um, which is why I said I'd do a, a potentially consider doing a, a tracheostomy, but it depends on if, if it's a, your cricothyroidomy is going to be your quickest access to the airway. Um, yeah. And are your trainees taught both techniques? Someone else wants to know. Yeah, we don't have as um, uh, structured teaching, I think, for our trainees as, as you guys do. Um, certainly when I went through training, there was no 
you know, we didn't have wet labs or, or any um, anything like that. The advice to us and our teaching was for emergency cricothyrotomy, and I think that still applies. Um, and um, often your first experience with doing it is in a real situation with, um, you know, with a real patient. I'm going to ask all the panel now, this is an interesting question from the audience. If you had to be intubated yourself, would you prefer video laryngoscopy or standard laryngoscopy? It depends on the provider. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I, I think um, it depends on the device, it, and, but most importantly, it depends on the provider. Yeah. An experienced provider with either device is going to uh, do a, a great job with laryngoscopy, an inexperienced provider. Um, you're going to feel like you've had a rough night. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I would say it, it's, an, it's an interesting question, actually. The, um, I think the key here is, uh, is understanding what you mean by video laryngoscopy. Uh, and, and as Clinton highlighted, actually, um, having a Macintosh direct blade still can be a video-assisted laryngoscopy. Um, so it's one of the, the, the great things if you can find a, a, a good quality um, Macintosh blade that has a video on it, um, it never makes things worse. You can use it directly, you, um, you can turn the screen away from yourself if you want to or not look at the screen. So it never makes things worse because you're still using the same blade you would use without the video assist. It only ever makes things better. So, without question, if that was the device that we're using, I would say video laryngoscopy. I think the other good question, which is maybe slightly off topic, is would you prefer to have an awake fiber optic intubation or a tracheostomy under local? Um, and I think that also depends on the provider for both of those, but um, I'll, I would vote for a tracheostomy under local if that was me. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a really interesting study that uh, I think escaped um, the attention, unfortunately, um, of the anaesthetic world uh, done out of shock trauma in Baltimore where they looked at a year of uh, direct laryngoscopy versus video laryngoscopy uh, in um, trauma patients. And when they did a subgroup, a, a subgroup analysis on the head injured patients, there was increased uh, morbidity on the, uh, on the patients who had video laryngoscopy. Now, the interesting thing with this, brilliant study, because all of their resuscitations and intubations are filmed, uh, in, like, so the whole resuscitation room, and they were able to also record the monitors. So there was absolute confirmation of how long it took, and there was about a minute delay between uh, direct versus video. So video was actually slower. Now, the interesting part of this is the device they were using was a glide scope, because in America, that cornered most of the market. So you're talking about a hyperangulated blade. All the anaesthetists intubating these patients were very familiar with the device, but there was still a clinically significant delay to intubation using the hyperangulated blade, which because of the CO2 and all of the hypoxia associated with that small delay caused increased morbidity in these patients. Um, and it just goes to exactly the point that has been raised by multiple members on the, the um, panel here, that, um, that you know, we all talk about video versus direct, but they all have different um, ergonomics and, uh, and geometrics that are really, really important and, if, and, uh, and affect your ability for tube delivery. Um, and that's the real key. Because it's not to how quickly you see the larynx, it's how quickly you are intubating the uh, trachea that's important. <clears throat> There's a question for Andy here. Do you, what size cannula would you put in preemptively? And do you routinely use ultrasound for it or not? Yeah, the, um, I tend to put a 16 gauge inside cannula in um, uh, as, as my preemptive. I have a, um, a, a way that I like to do it. Uh, just, you know, the pressure you have to apply with a slightly smaller cannula makes it feel uh, less invasive. Uh, putting a cannula in a weight patient is uh, sometimes feels quite, uh, quite challenging. Uh, I mean, at the moment, uh, do I use ultrasound uh, routinely? No, because I'm only doing it, uh, like I said before, I've only done it in patients where I can palpate the anatomy and I'm comfortable in finding that anatomy. But, I mean, what is interesting, I mean, I, I've run the this airway fellowship for many years now. I think we've had 35, 40 airway fellows over the time. 
Uh, I've had a few cases, one quite recently, about 12 months ago, where when I asked them, the, uh, we failed to, uh, to mark out the cryothyroid membrane, they've marked out a higher thyroid. Um, uh, you know, so one of the things, if I'm not sure, I would go lower. Um, and there, there are some theoretical benefits for that as well. Just quickly, I'm going to take you back to the first patient. One of the audience members has asked, would you have thought of waking up the patient, the first patient? I mean, the, I, th I think, I mean, there are scenarios where that, is, that might be appropriate. I think uh, the, what the problem here you've got is being judged by the retrospect scope. Um, I think if you've got that far down a case like this, you can't intubate, you can't auctionate with a, a variety of laryngeal mass, um, uh, and you can't bag a mass auctionate the patient. This is a difficult extubation. Um, and right there and then, uh, it may be not be the appropriate time to, to attempt that. So mm. it depends on who you've got around and what equipment and what help you've got. Um, but I think uh, waking a patient up is actually a pretty big call. Um, I would t tend to suggest to people that you would discuss it with your colleagues, but um, be very certain that this is going to be a nice, clean wake up. Otherwise, you're going to have to progress to some form of securing the airway. Well, we can't have a session like this without mentioning the vortex approach. I guess in most of these are somewhere in the vortex, aren't we? Uh, there was one other question. Would you change anything in the setting of pregnancy, late pregnancy, these first two cases? Would you do anything different? No, so I mean, it's... A, it's I mean, it's a good question as well. Um, the, uh, I mean, I think the, the differences in pregnancy, one of the main things I would worry about is increased bleeding. So if you have, uh, um, if you were to go for a scalp, it's interesting actually, there, there was a, a presentation at the OAA meeting last March in 2016, where following the, the difficult Air society guidelines of scalpel bougie only, um, there, this anethist had a, a CICO in an emergency GA section, um, and they attempted to do a scalpel bougie. And when they stuck the scalpel through the cracothyroid membrane, she had uh, quite a massive bleed. Um, I think uh, I was told the people when they were discussing it, she lost at one and a half to two and a half litres of blood from the incision through a cracothyroid membrane. Um, they never proceeded with. Um, uh, with the, the scalpel bougie attempt, because they were so um, horrified by the, the blood loss. Uh, and luckily for the patient, there was an intensivist who lived across the road who heard the arrest page, because he used to carry it around with him, and he ran over and managed to intubate her, and she survived. So um, yeah, I think the pregnancy thing is probably you know, bleeding would be my, my uh, biggest worry. I mean, we've, you know, it's one of the things, big things we talk about in the wet lab why we don't like to use scalpel blades and people who are still alive anyway is, um, uh, is the bleeding issues that, that occur. Can I ask the two anaesthetists on the, on the panel, do you think trainees are becoming less skilled at tracheal intubation? Yes. Well, um, uh, it's, I, I think it's, it's Sorry, pure, was that it's, a yes? Was it, that a no, yes? no, I, 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 a I, no? Think, I think it's a numbers thing. I think the truth is that, um, you know, talking, obviously I come, I, I am literally, you know, I just come at the end of my training now, so I, I'm one of the new generation of, and there's no doubt, we, did less, we do less numbers. There's more LMA cases, uh, more of the patients coming through ED are intubated by ED or by pre-hospital providers. Um, so we're just, we're less, exp we have less numbers of tracheal intubations in our training compared to the generations who've gone before us. And therefore, yes, absolutely, are we less skilled? Yep. Um, but I think that the challenge now is to, um, is to compensate for that. And I think one of the big things that I've learned through my emergency and military training and pre-hospital training is what we need to focus on is deliberate practice. So any technique, you, after you've done sort of 20 to 40 of them, unless you're undergoing deliberate practice, which is breaking the technique down to its component parts. So when I teach people intubation, I teach them um, introducing the laryngoscope, epiglottoscopy, um, sorry, uh, uh, uveloscopy, epiglottoscopy, 
and then laryngoscopy and tube delivery and break each of the steps of, laryngo of uh, intubation into its component parts and focus on each of the challenges of each of those different parts. And actually that's where videoscopes can be incredibly powerful because I as the educator can watch them do it while they're doing the intubation and I can talk them through that and potentially even record and then they can watch it. And so these are the ways that we can compensate for the reduced volume of practice and increase and in fact accelerate that learning curve for our, uh, for our junior trainees. So just to add to the training side of things, Australia-wide and worldwide actually there's been a very big spotlight on pre-hospital intubation and, and a couple of things that have been absolutely clear during all the studies and a learned colleague of mine, um, Andrew Fush, actually just put out a paper regarding pre-hospital rapid sequence induction. What's very clear is that those providers regardless of the title, but those providers that have the most initial appropriate training mm. and then ongoing exposure and have the most experience are the ones that have the best first pass effect. To the point where WA did a study of our own numbers and had a look at the intubation numbers uh, on the ambulance service here and we're finding that there's not enough exposure to individual paramedics on a day-to-day -day basis which takes us to, or takes us to our point of how we fix this and where we go in terms of the training. Training might not be the solution because you, getting exposure of these uh, paramedics to all these necks is going to be difficult. And it almost lends itself to reducing the amount of people that can actually intubate. So there's a smaller pool of providers and they are then having a bigger pool of patients. And currently the only, only, uh, only operators in Western Australia that provide rapid sequence induction in the ambulance service are those of us that work on the helicopter. So it's a very small, small people, 14 of us, constant exposure and also constant review and, and discussion about those cases. And we find that that's probably, you know, our success rates are pretty good. Yeah, I, I think, you know, what was one of the most fascinating studies for me was London HEMS published their last 7,000 intubations and they had a success rate of 99.6%. Now, this is a mixture of this. They've got neurosurgeons who work on the chopper doing intubations. They've got anaesthetists. They've got ED physicians. They've even got people who are sort of GPs, advanced providers. And, uh, and you know, their success rate in this austere environment of pre-hospital care was higher than any study done within anaesthetic departments or ED departments where the environment is much more controlled. And they've achieved this huge success rate by having a standardised approach and it, to both training and their delivery of the technique. Um, and I think that's something that we can take um, you know, away from the way that we should be approaching training our, uh, our trainees in terms of uh, giving them a standardised approach, a standardised way of uh, dealing with the airway. And then once they have that core competency of being able to intubate effectively, then you can start branching out to some of the more advanced techniques uh, that we are able to provide as anaesthetists such as fibre optic, etc. Yeah, look, I mean, I, 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 mean, I agree with uh, both both comments there. The, um, it, it is a numbers game, unfortunately, um, and there's probably not much way, uh, a way around that. I think uh, it's important to realise, again, that video laryngoscopy it can actually be very beneficial, um, especially if you have a separate screen so that the, you can still train direct laryngoscopy, but you can video it. Um, uh, it was very interesting. I, they, uh, I've, I asked every trainer I, I work with, how, how do you, before they would do an intubation, how do you hold your laryngoscope and how do you put it in the mouth? And none of them can describe it. And, and you know, I think for the problem in, in anaesthesia is that the laryngoscopy training is a matter of you do it until you can do it. Um, and we're, we're actually not very good at training laryngoscopy. And I think we need to improve that markedly with the numbers game that we're struggling against. Stuff like how to hold the head, how to open the mouth, how to introduce it, where to introduce it, how do you keep the teeth apart, things like that. Um, one, one person in the audience has asked Andy to describe his technique, scalpel finger bougie, but I, Andy, I think you have these videos on, available online, don't you? Is that still the case? So, so which Andy are we talking to now? <laughs> Sorry? Which Andy are we talking to? Which audience? Which Andy? Which Andy? Uh, yeah, Andy Heard. Yeah, so I mean, ours wouldn't be scalpel finger bougie, ours would be scalpel bougie. So I think the question might be to, uh, to, to Andy here. 
Yeah, so the scalpel finger Buji technique. Um, no, I didn't want to describe it. I just wanted to, uh, to let the audience know that they're available. That they are, yes. Yeah. So they're all available on YouTube. Correct. And uh, the best video, I would say, is go to the uh, Sydney Hems. Um, they have a uh, YouTube channel, and uh, and it's very well um, described there and demonstrated. I mean, if I could just add there, the um, <coughs> the scalpel bougie, which uh, most of the Neethis have been taught, and uh, which DAS have basically copied for their uh, algorithm, I mean, that was designed by us at Royal Perth in 2003, um, but it wasn't designed as, a, as a, 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 an only go-to uh, technique. I mean, we wrote a letter to, in reply to the DAS algorithm, basically saying if we were going to only do a scalpel technique, then it would be a scalpel finger bougie technique, not a scalpel bougie technique. Um, uh, so the, I think that's kind of, uh, uh, I've got that a bit wrong. Thank you. Uh, maybe the last question, I think, is for Fiona. Fiona, do you and your colleagues see many patients that have had their necks butchered by anaesthetists with airway rescue techniques? Uh, well, no. I mean, it's unfortunately an uncommon, it's an uncommon scenario. Um, yeah, no, I can think maybe one patient who I recall had had an emergency airway, I think, you know, pre-arrival to hospital, but um, but no, so are they having longer term complications? Is that maybe what the question is? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it was uh, Dr Doyle from Canada who said it's better to be alive with a scarred neck than dead with a pristine one, didn't he? So I think I'll stop the questions there. Thank you so much for your uh, audience participation. I'm going to ask the group one tip that they could leave with us. One tip for us to take home in your airway armamentarium. Yeah, I mean, I would say if you work somewhere where they don't have a CICO pack, then you can carry one with you, just like Andy carries his scalpel. So, um, you know, that the, the fact that you work in hospitals that haven't provided you with a, a CICO equipment so you can put a cannula in, uh, it's quite easy to carry that stuff with you as well. Andy Chalam? I just think uh, mentally rehearse this in your head. This will hopefully be something that you never see in your career. I wish that on every single one of you. Um, but if that time comes for any one of you, I think if you've mentally rehearsed it, you are clear in your head the approach you're going to take, you understand the equipment and the steps involved in that procedure, you are going to be eminently ready to step up at that challenge and do the right thing for your patient. That was uh, part of what I was going to say, thanks Andy, but what we teach our new critical care paramedics is that if you're drawing up rocuronium and ketamine, then you pull out your scalpel and be prepared to use it. So we, we, we put yourself into that mind frame from the beginning. It's not an emergency, it's just part of the process and it might be at the end of the process, but that's your, that's your steps that you're going to follow. Um, I'd echo that as well. Um, yeah, my, first, my first emergency airway I was on a real patient. We didn't have the wet lab experience then, and but I think I had done a thousand in my head at night. Every night I was on call as a registrar, waiting for that that moment. So when it you know, when it happened, it was like I had done I had done it before. Um, and also just not to be not to be afraid of of a scalpel and um, you know making a cut into an airway and having a tracheostomy or a cricothyroidotomy. It's not you know it's not a big deal for the patient. They don't have any their risk of having long-term problems is, is very low and, and better to be alive than and have a cut in your neck. I agree with that. And try it out at the wet lab. Yeah. yeah. Try it out on something. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, to conclude then, I hope that the opinions you have heard from our panel have challenged you. Maybe they've reinforced your own biases, or maybe they prompted you to review the way you think about the way you could manage some of these terrible situations and scenarios. And let's face it, one of you is going to have a Kaiko situation this month. Um, please help me thank our panellists, Clinton van der Vesthoven, Andy Chellen, Andy Hurd and Fiona Whelan. That concludes the session.